Hi, and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus. And I had another video planned for this week, different subject, but once again, I have to say a few things about 5G stuff because there have been uh, several things that I have read, several questions that people have asked me, and um, a few common misconceptions about 5G, so I wanted to give a few more details, as well as uh, a few recent news items that everyone might find interesting. So the first thing is that, uh, okay, Wi-Fi that is called Wi-Fi 5 or 5G Wi-Fi is not actually 5G. 5G is the fifth generation of the wireless cellular uh, voice and data network. And uh, five, five g Wi-Fi is actually 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. It's the specific frequency that is used. Today, Wi-Fi is generally either 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. So several people I've read comments or they commented on my videos or I've read in various articles, comments and other articles, People saying, like, I don't understand what the big deal is, because I've had 5G for several years now. Uh, I've got 5G Wi-Fi on my internet service provider's router that they gave me. And that is not actually the 5G that we're talking about here. That's 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, which is uh, one of the latest and greatest flavors of Wi-Fi, which also happens to use MIMO, M-I-M-O, uh, multiple input, multiple output, which is a similar technology that is going to be used in 5G, the real 5G, which is the fifth generation cell network. Um, they use similar technologies, but they are two completely different animals. So it's not until um, just within the past couple of years that uh, actual 5G networks were rolled out in mostly large cities around the world. And um, the first, uh, I don't remember which was the actual first 5G phone, but for example, Samsung just released their Galaxy S10 5G at the low, low price of $1,299. That happened just recently. So um, 5G that, that we're talking about here in terms of millimeter waves is a, a completely different animal than the 5 gigahertz flavor of Wi-Fi. The second thing is um, various people have said things like, well, you know, 5G can't possibly be bad for you because, um, like a commenter on one of my previous videos said, hang on a minute, well, if, if, you know, 5G millimeter waves are blocked by things like leaves on a tree, then it can't possibly actually hurt us. Well, yes, it actually can, because the way that it works is when we say that it blocks a signal, it doesn't mean that the radio waves are actually blocked. The way that it generally works is uh, we say that signals are attenuated. So you have your little 5G millimeter wave traveling along and you have a leaf on a tree. And it's not like the, the radio wave just comes along and goes boink and like vanishes off into nothing. Usually what happens is uh, all or part of the wave is reflected. Uh, it can be absorbed. So the actual leaf on the tree is absorbing part of the energy, which of course is why it it causes these, these strange effects to both plants, insects, humans, that sort of thing. Uh, it's, not, it's not simple. It's about attenuation. We also talk about rain fade. So even with like uh, 4G systems, for example, you can have rain fade. And what that means is like in air, your radio wave is traveling through the air. But if it starts raining, you have all these little water droplets falling through the air. And each of those water droplets is going to uh, interfere with the radio wave and weaken it or reflect it or, uh, you know, bend the way, you know, it's going to, it's going to cause the signal to become attenuated or weakened from the point of view of your receiver, such that the more it rains, the more rain fade you have, and the weaker your received signal is, the, the, the poorer your connection and so on. So, um, just because things like leaves and walls are blocking these signals, uh, doesn't mean, I mean, technically, the human body blocks the signal. That doesn't mean that we're like Superman and a bullet is bouncing off our chest. It means that the signal may not actually pass through us, but that doesn't mean that it isn't actually being absorbed and dispersed throughout our tissues, our cells, and causing all kinds of problems. So um, that is not a, a simple subject by any stretch of the imagination. The propagation of radio waves and how it works is like, you can specialize in that area, and it is extremely highly technical and totally crazy. 
Okay, so the next thing is this idea of 5G and steerable beams. Uh, they call it uh, beam forming or beam shaping, and of course the idea is that uh, you're going to have, an, instead of like an old system where you have a cellular network, you have an array of antennas, and it's basically like an antenna and it transmits and covers a chunk of land. Because of the higher frequencies used, because of these millimeter waves, uh, the higher the frequency, the, the more poorly they propagate, more or less and the shorter the distance of that propagation. So that's why we're going to need upwards of 200 times more antennas. And uh, also, in order to uh, have better coverage, or optimal coverage, let's say, uh, they're going to use uh, phased array antennas. Now you may recognize this term phased array from things like phased array radar in relation to, like, fighter jets. And essentially what a phased array is, is the, the higher the frequency you get, the, the lower, the, the, the smaller your antenna can be. So, uh, like for, for radar and also for 5G, what they're going to do is you're going to have like an array of little tiny antennas. Uh, it can be like four, four antennas by four antennas, eight by eight, 16 by 16. So you have this basically grid of antennas instead of a single one. You have a grid of antennas. And then those antennas are actually fed signals, and it's all computer controlled. It's electronically controlled. And what you end up being able to do is you can vary, like, the power and change the phase and this sort of thing of the signals that you're feeding to your, your, your grid of antennas. And that gives you something like this, where by varying certain parameters electronically, uh, the radio waves that are being sent from each individual little antenna in the grid will kind of overlap and you can kind of think of it like where they overlap, they strengthen, and where they don't, they weaken. So this is, essentially gives you an electronically steerable beam. And in, by that, that's obviously for radar, that makes sense. Because if you have a fighter jet in the nose of the plane, you have a phased array radar. Because you want that radar, to, you want to be able to scan the beam. But the only way to do that, without an electronically controlled phased array system, the only way to do that is to actually physically steer your antenna. Um, there are other considerations with phased array antenna systems. Uh, the total transmit power of individual antennas in the grid might be smaller, but the combined effect, when these waves are sort of overlapping each other and strength strengthening each other, you get sort of a higher effective power in your, in your beam, in the beam itself. Um, again, that gets like super, super complicated. But the point is that we're not talking about sort of like a Hollywood movie laser-like death ray here. Um, we're talking about phased array uh, technology. It's something that we've had for a very long time. And in fact, you know, certain like military radars use similar frequencies for tracking, you know, enemy targets and that sort of thing. And it is essentially that technology which is being adapted for use uh, to send communication signals to your smartphone which is pretty crazy because like phased array radars can be tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars so obviously a lot of money has been spent developing phased array antennas for 5G a lot of money um, so not not a laser like uh, Hollywood death ray but that's that's essentially what the steerable beams mean and of course if you have steerable beams uh, you can also avoid interference you can you can more precisely target a user's device uh, and prevent it from interfering, interfering with another beam that's targeting some other user's device. You also have to wonder, well, if you have this more concentrated beam and it's specifically directed at a person at the device, uh, what does that mean in terms of health? Like, uh, we have an idea, but we don't know for sure yet, and, you know, organizations like the FCC are not really looking into that terribly much, which is not a good idea. Um, also, when you have a, a 5G smartphone, it's going to have a similar array of antennas inside. The ten antennas can be little teeny tiny things. It's going to have one of these arrays, and they're kind of designing things so that, okay, yeah, it'll be shielded and blah, 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 but, you know, you're holding it with your hand. So what happens if that beam is going through your hand? Uh, obviously, your hand is covered in skin, millimeter waves, you know, sweat, sweat ducts. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting situation. Okay, so the next thing is that uh, 5G also is being sort of touted alongside this Internet of Things. So in addition to the fact that uh, 5G uses all kinds of different frequencies and um, you, know, you get different data rates and uh, different numbers of users depending on the particular system installed, um, 
there's also this whole Internet of Things. And the way that they're doing that is they're, they're going to incorporate a system. Uh, I have a paper here that has all the wonderful acronyms on it. They call it an LP-WAN, or Low Power Wide Area Network. And this involves two different technologies where um, they are for gizmos, like, for example, you might have an array of, of little gizmos that are stuck in the soil, and they're, they're, they're soil moisture samplers and senders. So you can have this array of sensors, and with the Internet of Things, you can monitor the moisture in the soil, and it'll transmit wirelessly. But the thing is that these things are not actually going to use the same sort of steerable beams and phased array antennas. These are, um, there's two particular technologies called NB-IoT and LTE-M, which are actually part of 4G, and they're already here. Uh, there will be sort of new versions of these systems that are sort of linked up with 5G. So when we talk about the 5G Internet of Things, uh, it's, it kind of covers uh, uh, this variety of different devices, and one of the groups of devices is these, these very low-power sort of sensor transmitter type applications. Uh, one of the, the, the reason why they're doing this differently is because, first of all, the frequency bands that these things are using, for example, for NB-IoT, currently the frequencies used are 450 megahertz to 2.2 gigahertz. Now, 4. 450 megahertz is like way less than 39 gigahertz for your smartphone, right? Um, the thing is, these are, these are very, uh, very low power devices. Uh, they, are, they have very long battery lives. So, for example, you can have like your little, your little soil sensor or something. And uh, because the, it's very low power, it's low frequency, it's not a super fancy device no phased array antenna, none of, none of that nonsense, um, it can have a little battery and the battery life will last for like up to 10 years. But um, as I say, these are, this is, these are actually technologies that already exist for 4G and they're sort of integrated with the spectrum of 4G in a certain way and so it's, it's like, but with 5G they're, they're saying, well, uh, yeah, we're going to sort of adapt that and we'll be able to incorporate that and yay Internet of Things. So it's, it's actually kind of funny because the whole Internet of Things is, in, in a sense, it's like already here. And it's not really part of 5G when you're thinking about millimeter waves necessarily. Uh, maybe these people are thinking long term where we're going to have, you know, even your little sensor will have a tiny little, you know, steerable beam antenna. That's crazy because that would take a very long time and a very large investment of money to get to that point. So um, anyway, the point there is that uh, 5G is sort of like a blanket term as well being used to cover all these different things and so that's part of the reason why it's so confusing because it's, it's difficult enough to even find any information on what kind of system is being deployed and, and how, you know, how it works and uh, all you keep hearing is 5G, Internet of Things, 5G, Internet of Things and it's sort of being evangelized and pushing it as much as possible uh, when no one is really actually talking about, well, you know, like, for example, these low-power devices, that's already here. That's, like, that's not actually anything new. Um, but I guess, you know, they want us to buy stuff, so, eh, whatever. So recently there was a news story about uh, 5G may interfere with uh, weather forecasting. And uh, it was a little bit strange, because you're never quite sure, like, is this just, you know... Uh, you have to kind of check these things and make sure that it's something real. And it turns out that apparently it is real because um, uh, you can go on the Senate.gov website, and I have here in front of me, it's uh, an information brief from the U.S. Navy, and it was in fact the U.S. Navy on March 27th, 2019, who came out and said uh, that uh, there could be operational impacts and loss of NOAA and NASA satellite data resulting from the FCC spectrum auction for 5G. So, in short, um, they say that remotely sensed observations, and then in parentheses, water vapor, may be degraded or lost due to growing interference from the broader adoption of 5G, specifically in the 24 gigahertz bands. So they say that, okay, if we have 5G and you're in the 24 gigahertz band, then it's going to interfere with these water vapor sensors. And Well, the problem with this is that it could affect weather forecasts related to precipitation, sea surface height, ice observations, tropical cyclone analysis, and that sort of thing. So obviously, um, 
yeah, if if this isn't addressed, as far as I can tell, they sent this little this little information informational memo type thing to the FCC, and the FCC, as usual, kind of didn't really do anything. So what the Navy recommends is that the FCC tighten out of band interference by reducing bleed over limits. Basically, that instead of using the 24 gigahertz band, that they just kind of leave that frequency alone and say, okay, give us enough space so that our sensors keep working and everything is hunky dory. Um, you know, will that happen? I don't know. But uh, that was an interesting story in addition to, you know, protests and, and the Senate hearings and all this other kind of stuff. Um, it's definitely potentially causing problems. The other thing is that there was another story where uh, a bunch of people were coming out and saying, well, hang on a minute, we may have a problem here because, as I mentioned in an earlier video, uh, they want to do uh, 5G coverage also via satellite. And right now there are several thousand satellites in orbit, uh, 6,000 and some or something like that. And, of course, they want to actually launch an additional 20 or 26,000 satellites, possibly, uh, which, obviously, when you have that many transmitters, uh, that many, you know, objects reflecting light and that sort of thing in, in, in a low-Earth orbit, uh, that could actually interfere with astronomy. Um, would it really be a problem? Well, apparently, it, they think it's enough of a problem to actually say something about it. I just thought it was interesting that uh, there are other considerations here where it's pretty clear that um, they've just kind of pushed forward with it and they're really kind of trying to get it out the door and installed as fast as possible without even consulting uh, people like, you know, people who are forecasting the weather and, pe you know, astronomers and, and this sort of thing, and not to mention, you know, no one's listening to health effects. Speaking of the negative health effects of wireless stuff, um, there is a video that you must not miss. I will link to it in the description. Um, there is a woman by the name of Dr. Erica Mallory Blythe. She is a, uh, a doctor in the UK, and there's a, there's a presentation from 2014 called Electromagnetic Radiation Health in Children. And I will link to this video at the end. It's about an hour and nine minutes long, but you totally have to watch it, because this is quite possibly the best presentation I've ever seen. And she's not, she, I, I don't think she even mentions uh, 5G in the video, but she's talking about all the all already existing technologies we have, 3G, 4G, uh, Wi-Fi, that sort of thing. And she's particularly concerned about, like, for example, the use of Wi-Fi in schools. And if you thought that any of my videos on 5G were interesting, you really need to watch Dr. Mallory Bly's presentation. Uh, even though it is an hour and nine minutes long, it is jam-packed full of basically everything that I said and studies that I quoted, and like a ton more. And her presentation is very, very good. Um, she quotes all kinds of facts and figures and statistics. She has, uh, you know, a nice PowerPoint presentation, and it's very down-to-earth and easily comprehensible because her, her audience was not a bunch of, you know, doctors and scientists. It was basically, you know, your average parents. So uh, I do highly recommend you watch Dr. Erica's video. Uh, again, that link is in the description. And, yeah, that's about it. So uh, for more Techie Tips, see scottystech.info. Thanks for watching. See you next time.